Good afternoon to you. Mark Sadath, HurricaneTrack.com here Monday now, the 16th of October, 2023. Back from Texas and the annular eclipse. I'll show you some videos that I took from that at the end of today's update. But a bulk of the discussion today will be about climatology and how it seems to be winning out. You know, we had uh, what looked like to be a pretty significant development coming with 94L. The Euro was leading the way. It was leading the charge with pretty aggressive development several days ago, even before I left on Thursday. And then it looked like it was really going to ramp it up. The GFS finally got on board, and then the Canadian, the CMC model there. And then they all sort of started doing the shell game, if you will, uh, mixing and matching. You know those three shells? You might have seen videos of that. You know what I'm talking about. And I think climatology is the hand controlling those shells. How about that for a metaphor for you? Yes, climatology definitely playing a role here. We could still see development from this system, 80% chance, as I'll show you, from the National Hurricane Center site. But climatology is there for a reason. What do I mean by all that? Well, let's first take a look at it, and we'll get started, all right? So let's use, I guess, sky blue here to make things contrast. Peak of the hurricane season's come and gone. We are sitting, like, over here somewhere. And normally we do get a little bit of a small bump this time of the year climatologically speaking but overall we're way lower look at all this that we have already come through this is all come and gone and so we're still on the downward part of climatology so the odds that something gets developing that far east that 94L is it's just the odds are against it climatology you know over history over time this data from 1944 through 2020 that this particular graph is and chart is based on. Yet we're sitting around here and we're on the downtrend. And so no wonder this thing is struggling to develop. Despite all the very warm water relative to average still out here. Look at this, getting really warm again compared to average. The Gulf still warmer than average. There's our El Nino. All that's there, but that doesn't trump the climatology, as we would say, right? Climatology, dry air, strong upper level winds cutting across, whatever the case may be, we don't have hurricanes out in this area frequently in mid-October for a reason, even when you have record warm water temperatures. However, another however, right? This is all part of the shell game. Now you see it, now you don't. Where is it? Well, there it is, and it's at a fairly low latitude right down there just a little bit north of 10 degrees north latitude which is right here pretty good straight line if i may say so myself 80 percent chance that this will go on to develop somewhere in this vicinity over the next seven days we can see that on the expanded seven day outlook they did a much better job of drawing their red area than i did with my orange or whatever it was but yeah you get the idea it could still happen uh but it's not happening yet and it doesn't look as aggressive and I'll show you that on the modeling here in just a minute. But we do need to watch it because we could get some impacts here in the islands. We might not. It might be up here that it starts to develop. We don't know yet because it's still this is still several days away. So this is, you know, I said last week, let's see how it all looks on Monday. Well, here we are Monday, and we still don't really have any answers. The trades down here are slowing down this time of year. So it's not racing across fast like we would see in August and September. So we're going to just have to wait. But yes, our friends here from Barbados and the northern Lesser Antilles will need to watch this. I think southern parts here, the Windward Islands, probably going to be okay in terms of any appreciable impacts. Heavy rain, that's the number one concern I'd have right now. Possibly some gusty winds, maybe some strong sustained wind, maybe. And maybe some ocean impacts, big waves, so forth, if this were to develop. But we're just, we'll have to wait. I mean, sometimes we just don't know for sure. Now, this is interesting. Climatology would suggest that the eastern Pacific would be calming down by now. But it's not. We've got a couple of other areas that look like they are going to go on to develop over the next several days as well. And again, our friends here, probably from Puerto Vallarta up through Mazatlan, maybe elsewhere up here on the Pacific side of the Mexican coast, we have to watch this one in particular. If we look at uh, the modeling here in a little bit, you'll understand why. All right, so 
satellite animations here, courtesy of Tropical Tidbits. There's our first area. There's our second one down here. Still very active in the eastern Pacific. All that favorability is over here. We haven't really developed that big gyre yet in the western Caribbean. And I'm going to tell you something. Bring me back on for a minute. The sands of the hourglass, they're not running faster. There's no such thing as that, I don't think, right? But they certainly seem to be because we're now just past, or right at, however your perspective is, mid-October. And, you know, look at most of the U.S. right now. There's a little bit of cloud cover here in the east. Everything else is clear. Dry air, cool air, fall is here. All this cloudiness you see in the Gulf of Mexico, that is a great sign. That is the cool, dry, dense air spilling across. We call that cold air advection, the lateral horizontal movement of, in this case, cooler, drier, denser air. That's even prevalent off the east coast, the southeast coast of the U.S., Yes, it is seemingly making the uh, sands of the hourglass move faster for United States interests in terms of any impacts from the tropics. But it's not over yet, and you just never know, right? Boy, look at that system right there. Uh, I think that's that storm Babette or Babbitt, however you, B-A-B-E-T. I might be wrong, so don't yell at me in the comments, but that certainly caught my eye. I saw something about it on Twitter. Um... I guess we can talk about it tomorrow, but boy, look at that. That is a non-tropical system. You can see the front associated with it. But yes, it is quite formidable for sure. Now down here in the deep tropics, leftovers of Sean right in here. There's the large area of energy with 94L. There's another piece of energy down here at a very low latitude. So there still are areas out here that could try to develop later on but boy again that word climatology strong upper level winds you can just see that there there's some dry air still out here um, the lack of deep convection over here you can just tell that climatology is winning hence the title of the thumbnail today and the title card climatology seems to be winning out not much going on in the Caribbean itself and again the Gulf here the Western Atlantic dominated by drier stable air more stable air now coming down off of the continent out into our ocean areas that'll help to cool things down and look you can even see the stalled front down here and without a solid central american gyre in place i don't really see anything happening in central america on the caribbean side in terms of development risk over the next five to maybe seven days so that's good news but these two areas in the pacific we need to watch them and we'll get over to the modeling here in just a second, and I'll show you. First, let's look at the Atlantic, and we'll point out our players. There's the leftovers of Sean. That's 94L right there. Not very impressive, vorticity-wise. I mean, our storm up here, our ocean storm, uh, that's a lot more impressive, but it's spread out over a big area because it's non-tropical. It's up in the high latitudes, as is this system. Uh, it gave you guys in New England another miserable weekend, I think. It's certainly rainy and raw. I guess miserable is your perspective. You know, some people like that kind of weather. Some people don't. And uh, spoiler alert, you're going to have another nasty weekend coming up. It's just one after the other, it seems. When they get the cold air involved, maybe we'll get some snow up here eventually. We'll have to see how all that works out. But for now, there's Sean. There's 94L. And there is some other energy sitting down here. So let's just kind of put this into motion this is our GFS here right there from the 12 Z run and let's just eke this out into time it's like hey the GFS develops it now in about 66 hours you can see that right there all right and uh, brings it on uh, well to the east of the islands and then it kind of dissipates a little bit and that's not the right word diminishes the other D word not quite dissipated but diminishes see that it strengthens and then it diminishes and then it gets flipped around the backside of the subtropical high out there, tries to strengthen again a little bit. Now we're out at, you know, eight days, seven days, eight days, whatever. So we shall see. Speaking of the Canadian, I don't show this very much, but I'm going to show it now. And then I'm going to jump on here real quick. I was reading a tweet. I should have had it ready. My apologies. I remember things later and eh, I bring them up. Even if I don't have the evidence to back it up, you got to trust me on this. And you can go look it up yourself. Uh, Dr. Ryan Maui had a tweet talking about the global models and how they're doing. 
the ECMWF still seems to be reigning supreme right now. And he mentioned in the tweet that the Canadian is definitely gaining ground and it's in the top three. That's pretty amazing. So good job to Environment Canada and our friends up north. Seriously, the Canadian's doing well in its overall skill. So let's see what it does with our tropical systems. There's X Sean, there's the energy with 94L, and there's some additional energy down there. So what's the Canadian got in store for 94L? As we move this out into time, it's farther to the south with 94L, and it goes through the northern northeastern leewards there, not too far from Puerto Rico, and that's five days out. So we're going to have to watch that closely to see what happens. And uh, speaking of the king, King Euro, people like to call it that, what does it show? These are 24-hour increments. Again, X Sean 94L right there, just to give you your bearings. And we have this out, 24, 48, 72. It's like, eh, doesn't do much with it. Now, this is what bothers me and should bother everybody that watches this stuff. If something is going to happen, we want consistency. If it's not going to happen, we also want consistency there. This shell game, like I said, the back and forth, the euro is on, it's aggressive, it's going to do something, then it's not. And now the GFS shows it and the GFS is aggressive, then it's not. And only the Canadian is consistent or whatever. That's not helpful. And it's nobody's fault. People aren't throwing the models, you know, like you throw a game or whatever for some benefit. There's no nefariousness that I'm aware of, but it's just frustrating that what if we only had one global model? Real quick theoretical deal here, Fantasyland for you. Let's say there was just the ECMWF for whatever reason, and we were looking at it, you know? Let's just go back uh, a couple of days. This is yesterday, a couple of days. It's 24 hours ago. Um, a little bit of a... Uh, a reflection there, okay, that's fine. Well, how about 24 hours before that? 12Z on Saturday. Oh, that was a hurricane at that point in time. Very well developed in the model, right? And then we go back 24 hours before that, 12Z on Friday. Eh, not much. You see where I'm going with this? And then we go back one more time, 12Z on Thursday, the day that I was going to be leaving for Texas and all that, right? That's what got everybody all in a tizzy. Right? So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, five days later, now we have <laughs> like, okay, and that's just five days. It's not like, oh man, you were looking out 10 days, 16 days on the GFS or whatever. Five days. That's not very reliable overall for Genesis. Does this really matter overall? Nah, people are watching it. They know, but you know, it would be nice to have some consistency. That's all I'm saying. Even though models get ranked and so forth, the Euro still not perfect, and none of them are. But I just you know, it's frustrating because we don't know exactly what to expect. Now, in the uh, Eastern Pacific, this is very important because we just had uh, our hurricane over there, Lydia, that made landfall just south of Puerto Vallarta. Uh, and of course it brought flooding to Puerto Vallarta and it was a pretty strong hurricane really slamming up against the mountains there right along the coast so it diminished quickly but it did bring some fairly substantial impacts to this region right through here pretty isolated small area because once they do hit the Mexican coast they weaken fast um, and so now we've got another piece of energy out here this is the one here now watch what happens as we go through time this is the GFS and let's see what it's showing. This ramps up fairly quickly. And then it starts to just kind of sit there a little bit, lingering just off the Baja. So Cabo San Lucas, this is a week out. May or may not do need, do need to watch this, you know? Like, we don't know. That's a week away. And then it finally comes in there northwest of Mazatlan. Mazatlan is more like right there, roughly. So we got to watch this. You know, there could be some impacts, again, for Pacific Mexico and this, of course, is beyond the seven-day time frame. But you see the general idea. It might try to go out. We never know. And just, again, to compare, what does the euro show? And, again, we're looking at 24-hour increments. 24, 48, 72, 96, 120, and so forth. 6, 7. All right. What a difference, right? So, again, agreement amongst the models just isn't happening yet.
So that's why we watch, because nothing is ever easy. Well, sometimes it is. You get these occasional ones like Irma was pretty easy to predict overall until it got close to Florida. Then it became a big headache, right? Right. Anyway, let's take a look at something that was easy to predict, because it's just simple math, right? It is. It's amazing. I want to pause this for a second. It is math. The astronomers, they all figure it out using math that is way above my skill level, and they can predict these eclipses into the future with precision. I remember they were talking about this on Fox Weather. I did a few appearances myself on Saturday, and as I was watching the programming, waiting my turn, I could hear them talking about it, and it was really like it. I, I knew this from when I took physics and astronomy in college, but like it is amazing that this can be figured out hundreds of years into the future, it seems, decades. Oh, the next total eclipse or whatever is going to happen exactly at this time and exactly these locations. But the weather on our planet, five days out, we have these huge discrepancies. Wow. Anyway, there you go. It's just, that's why this is interesting, isn't it? I think so. It's part of it anyway. So I went out there to the Midland Odessa area, got to meet a lot of great people that are friends of our project that we've known for years. That was really special to see all of you. You know who you are. It was great to hang out with you. I took my DSLR and I put a, I think it was a 300 millimeter lens on it, a solar filter. Never done it before. Just, hey, I think this will work. Got a couple of tips from my friend Jesse and this is what I was able to produce. I did a, uh, a recording, a 4K movie, recording right under the chip of the DSLR. There's the crescent. The moon, of course, the black area, right? Covering up that crescent. And I did a, you know, put it into processing in Adobe Premiere to create this time-lapse movie. And eventually you get the ring of fire. And it jiggles, of course, because it's a little bit windy out there. I don't have a $10,000 gyroscopically stabilized telescope. You know, it's a nice little Canon DSLR. But there comes the ring of fire. It was so cool. Oh, my goodness. It was so neat to see. Uh, very impressive. We could hear people cheering all around us at the University of Texas Permian Basin. I was at their campus. The moon moves across. The ring of fire was over. And that was it. Now we get ready for the, the real big deal um, next April. But then I did some other things. I did time lapses using other cameras of the pinhole effect from the leaves on the various trees of the parking lot. And again, just seeing that change over time, and they're jiggling and moving because you had different bursts of wind. And watch, you're going to see a crow in about four frames of film, so to speak. Well, it's digital film, right? There's going to be a crow that goes across the shot. I was like, what was that? You'll see it in just a second here. And um, we get to the ring of fire phase. There he goes. And uh, it comes and goes, the crow and the ring of fire. Never seen a time lapse of this. And I was like, I'm going to do that. So that was from one of my cameras. This is from a wider angle GoPro shot. You can see the GoPro and the tripod shadow there as well. Look at all those little crescents moving across the parking lot there at UTPB in Texas. Finally, this was really neat. The sky changes color. No processing at all. No filtering. No manipulation. This is straight from the GoPro. The GoPro Max, there's the sun. You got that beautiful blue Texas sky. The dew point was low. The humidity was low. Not a cloud in the sky. The sun was just brilliant. Then, as the moon went across and started blocking it out, you'll see here in just a little bit, everything starts to change colors. And it was so interesting right there. You see the colors starting to change, especially there. It gets to be this weird tinty color like you're looking through window tint and I had to stop it because I had to pack everything up and get out of there I couldn't let it just that's like another hour and I had to catch a flight back to uh, North Carolina but as I go through fast look at how it changes color there isn't that neat I just think that's neat it changed the entire look of the atmosphere around us and we all notice that and you can see that effect even without eclipse glasses just looking around and that'll happen again when the total eclipse happens next April in an area from Mazatlan, Mexico, northeast through most of North America along the totality path, you know, Indiana, Texas, Missouri, 
Uh, go to greatamericaneclipse.com and you can learn more about it there. But it was really cool. I'm glad I went. Again, I got to hang out with some really nice people, and that made it even more special. So I wanted to show you off a little bit of my eclipse handiwork. Lots of pictures, lots of people into it in the path of annularity that went northwest to southeast this time. And I don't understand that part yet. I, I must have slept through that day of physics and astronomy. Dr. Brian Davis at UNC Wilmington is probably like, Mark, you should have been paying attention. You'd have remembered. Like, why do they crisscross like they do? That's, that's interesting as well. All right. Hopefully, this video is interesting enough that you'll watch it, like it, and share it. All that good stuff. And um, I'll get it online for you so you can do just that. We'll keep watching to see what's happening out there. Does climatology keep winning on its winning streak as of late? Or will the Atlantic sort of overcome that climatological background state and give us Tammy or maybe more later? We'll see. Stay tuned to find out. As always, thanks for tuning in from all of us here at Hurricane Track. Good to have you with me. I'm Mark Suttoth. I'll be back with more for you tomorrow.